All right, good. So today it's a pleasure to have uh, Josephine. And today, exceptionally, we'll be connecting by Zoom. And this setup, uh, this setup is just that the mic will be on. So if you have any questions in the audience, you can just speak up and then uh, Josephine will be, will be able to hear you. So that being said, today, uh, she will be telling us about space, time, and gravity from quantum mechanics. So please take it away. Uh, thank you. So uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, so right now I'm getting like one um, ring back. Like when I say something, I, I hear it directly over my headphones. But uh, I think, yeah, I should be able to deal with this. Okay, so I'll just, um, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, uh, so I'm very excited to try to explain um, the ideas behind my recent work, I've, uh, which I've actually been working on for the past few years. And I think there's potentially much more to explore in this direction. So I'm excited to try to get across much of it as, uh, in as clear terms as possible. Uh, so advanced warning. Uh, well, okay, first I'll write the title. So advanced warning, um, I'm going to be introducing some calculations, uh, writing down equations, using physical considerations that may not be so familiar or that people have not seen before. So I wanna make my motivations for doing those things very clear. Uh, so let's start with some things that we already know in quantum gravity. So we have the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, <clears throat> between uh, quantum theories and gravitational theories in the one higher dimension. I'm trying to draw something like excitations and correlators in NSCFT here. So we have um, some maybe gravitational theory in the bulk. Um, and this uh, correspondence or duality is for most intents and purposes, um, we can think of it as, as a black box, if you like. So let's see. <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of like a black box where we know how to put in things on one side. So I'm trying to draw a box covered in a black cloth. <laughs> so we know how to put things on one side and uh, get things out on the other side or maybe in the other direction. So for, for example, um, if we consider maybe um, scattering near the horizon of, of, of a black hole on the gravity side, on the CFT side, um, we know it's captured by the exponential growth of OTOCs. And um, of course, there are interesting questions we can ask about this black box. So for example, um, you know, how is the black hole information paradox um, resolved by the operations of this black box? I mean, how does, does it process microscopic states of the quantum theory if we, if we put it on the CFT side? And so these are questions about various aspects of the operations of this box, um, but, I think, of course, if we can, what we should ultimately aim to do is actually um, open this box, right? Uh, let's see, I'm gonna draw something here. And uh, try to dissect the mechanism, or uh, I wanna say the clockwork inside it, okay? So we wanna open the box and actually see how it works inside, okay? So maybe there's like some, some clockwork here, like, uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm <laughs> trying to draw some, um, okay, something like uh, what you would expect if you open like uh, a machine and you see like the, the things that are going around inside it. So, okay, it goes without saying if we can do this, if we can understand the mechanism of the duality well enough, 
we would be able to answer, you know, ideally any questions about any aspects of this, um, of the operation of this duality. Um, we would also be able to dissemble and reassemble the mechanism, this mechanism inside, um, uh, dissemble and reassemble it in some other setting, for example, to understand um, quantum gravity in flat space. This is ideally what we would like to do, okay? So, um, add a page here, okay. So what kind of questions are involved in figuring out this mechanism that I was referring to? And um, well, a big hint in this regard has been the Ru Takenagi formula. So the Ru Takenagi formula uh, is telling us that the information content of the boundary quantum theory is playing a huge role um, in the mechanism of the duality. So let me just draw some, some region here, okay. And the statement is that um, uh, in the gravity theory, uh, in anti sitter space that is dual to uh, quantum theory by ADS-CFT, after solving Einstein's equations, after solving Einstein's equations, we find the solution has a special property which is that the area of extremal surfaces are solving a particular problem in the quantum theory of computing quantum entropies of associated regions. I think uh, some down and then we can we can see we're still on the previous page. Sorry? We can't see anything that you're writing now. On the previous page? We're still on the previous page, yes. Oh, you're still okay. All right, is is this better? Well, well. Nothing, nothing changed. Not really. You can't see this second page? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, so I was trying, I, I actually drew like a picture of the Rutakenagi formula on the second page, but uh, I think for now I'll just try to erase this. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Okay. So I was talking about how um, the Ru Takenagi formula is a big hint about um, how this mechanism of ADS CFD works. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, okay. the statement is that <clears throat> if we have some gravity theory dual to a quantum theory via ADS CFT. After we solve Einstein's equations in the gravity theory, we find that the solution has a very special property, which is that the area of extremal surfaces is solving a particular problem in the dual quantum theory, which is um, computing the quantum entropies, um, which is the quantum and computing the quantum entropies of associated regions. So area of <clears throat> extremal areas of computing quantum entropies. So this really begs the question, you know, what quantum problem are Einstein's equations themselves solving? Right, because it must be on the basis of the equations themselves solving a particular problem relative to the boundary quantum theory that its solutions could have a special property like the RT formula. Okay, so this is um, a main question that I'll be trying to address. Um, what quantum problem are Einstein's equations solving? Also, another question that should um, naturally be answered in tandem is, what is the quantum significance
of the volume measure of space time. Um, in other words, instead of saying there is a gravity theory with some space time that is dual to a quantum theory by ADS CFT, we want to be able to say there is a particular problem we can formulate in the quantum theory and space time and gravity arise in the semi-classical limit of solving that problem. So I call this uh, deconstruction of gravity um, in, the, in these papers. Oh, sorry. Deconstruction of gravity. <clears throat> And uh, I hope I've made the, you know, multiple motivations for doing this um, somewhat clear. So what's a viable strategy for um, solving this problem? Okay, so well, we have at our disposal a stripped down solvable model of holographic duality called JT gravity. So in this uh, simple model, <clears throat> so in the solvable um, model of JT gravity, what we have is uh, a quantum description of, of the boundary degrees of freedom, um, so a complete quantum dis description. Um, representing a quantum observable, which um, assumes values in, in bulk space time. Okay, and um, on the gravity side, we have Einstein's equations, um, which are solving for a scalar field, the dilaton, which is actually linear in the field. So we have Um, Einstein's equations, which are solving for the diluton. So what we can do in this context, what we can hope to do is um, make a guess as to what quantum problem uh, gravity is solving for, then check the proposal by seeing whether we can derive Einstein's equations here uh, from, from the quantum theory. Okay, so this is essentially what I did. Um, I formulated a problem in quantum theory um, in a way that's actually quite general. Okay, so it, we can think about the problem of trying to apply it in other settings as well. But I, as a check, I applied it to JT gravity and um, verified that it gives the equations. Well, I applied, I applied the formulation to the uh, quantum theory of the boundary of JT gravity. And then I checked that I could obtain the equations of two-dimensional JT gravity in the semi-classical limit. And so um, the main feature of, of, of the solution is actually that uh, phi, uh, the dilaton field, or the area of compactified space at each point of the bulk space-time, should be identified from the point of view of quantum theory as a probability density Um, in the target space um, of a boundary observable, uh, whose evolution is constrained by uh, conditional quantum distributions, which are actually obtained um, using certain dynamical correlators in, in the boundary quantum theory. So conditional quantum distributions, oh, oops. Additional. And these are computed using um, dynamical correlators, which I'll introduce um, certain dynamical correlators. When you write at the bottom, we don't see it. 
Oh, you, you can't see? Ah, so um, can you see this? Oh. Um, this? Oh, sorry, I can see the words. Ah, sorry, now I can actually. Ah, you can see I have to adjust it, it on my own end though, it turns out. Okay. <laughs> okay. So probably for those in the lecture hall, if you, okay, I'm not sure. Okay, can you, in the lecture hall, can you see the whole board? Yes, yeah. yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so more generally. Fix? Sorry? What do you mean by the tar target space of X? Uh, yeah, so X is, uh, the quantum observable corresponding to the position of the boundary of JT gravity. And so the bulk space time I'm viewing here as the target space for that quantum observable. It's sort of turning around the fact that the boundary can be, um, can assume, you know, any point, assume any position in the bulk space time. You turn it around and just view the bulk, bulk space time as a space where this observable can assume values. <clears throat> okay, so more generally, let me try to. Can, can you guys see this this page? Uh, no, I don't. We can't see anything in right now. Anything? Nope. Okay, okay, just have to try erasing on this, erasing and writing, okay. Okay, so it, this um, was in JT gravity that we should identify the dilaton field as the area of compactified space. And more generally, um, the proposal, our proposal of conjecture is that the volume measure of space time, volume measure of space of space time would be identified from the point of view of quantum theory as a probability measure constrained with respect to um, quantum dynamics uh, where by quantum dynamics, I'm referring to, you know, a sequence of joint quantum distribution. Again, I'll explain how to um, calculate these distributions using correlators. And part of the same conjecture is that Einstein's equations in general relativity Einstein's equations in general relativity arises in the semi-classical limit of a generator equation um, describing the evolution of probability uh, with respect to um, uh, conditional quantum distributions or these joint quantum distributions, okay? semi-classical limit limit okay so of course not every sequence of joint quantum distributions will give rise to gravity in this way right so an important part of what i'll explain is um characterizing sequences for which we expect this to happen um okay so uh let's start I have a by... question. yeah yeah so <clears throat> Usually, by standard ADA safety canon, the correlators of the energy momentum tensor in the conformal field theory are related to bulk correlators of the metric in the in the ADA space time, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and and you can always talk about the correlators in terms of the solutions of the Einstein equation in the bulk. Mm -hmm. So, you can can't you relate 
Einstein's equations to codilators in the boundary theorem that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so are I you mean, saying um... by inverting the codilator in the bulk mm -hmm. by some means? Can't you relate the invert inverted version of the correlators in the of the energy momentum tensor in the conformal field theory, mm -hmm. and say that the Einstein's Einstein's equations are related to the conformal field theory in that way? Uh, I was just wondering. I mean, whether you can make a relationship. So, are that, you so. saying that? Uh, are you referring to the fact that, like, if you take a bulk correlator to the boundary, it will give you a correlator of of energy momentum tensors with a yeah, bulk the, correlator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is yeah, the, the usual bond, bulk bond boundary bond. relation. Uh, right. And uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm trying to directly um, identify the the quantum meaning of, of this uh, of um, the volume measure of space time here. Yeah. Uh, and showing that it satisfies an equation involving um, these. So I'll describe these dynamical correlators in more detail, but they're definitely not um, boundary correlators in the traditional sense. Yeah. So they're actually, um, they, they actually involve projectors onto bulk points. So um, that'll be more clear when I actually describe what those dynamical correlators are. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's start by defining um, joint quantum distributions. Joint quantum distributions. Okay. So um, let's imagine some quantum observable uh, X. Okay, so uh, represented by some you know operator in quantum mechanics. So um, it doesn't. We're not requiring it to be Hermitian, right? So because if it was Hermitian, it would assume values on the real line and you know what what we really want is like um, a, a target space of two dimensions or higher <laughs> so if we consider for example a normal operator it will have um, assume values in a two-dimensional target space so that's the kind of setting we're in and let's consider um, how to calculate the probability um, for this observable to assume the value um, value x1 at time t1. Okay. So let's consider this pairing and computing the probability for the observable to assume value x1 at time t1. Okay. And this um, is given by trace of rho, the density matrix of the system, multiplying uh, projection operator onto the eigenspace of the Hilbert space with eigenvalue x1, right? So for now, we're working um, in the discrete case. So the operator, you know, has some possible values that it can assume which are discrete, and this is the probability. So, so far, this is... Um, just an application for, for the you know standard rule for how to compute probabilities in quantum mechanics. So we take the trace of rho times the projection corresponding to the event, right? And um, in particular, this is um, a bona fide probability which um, sums to one over possible values of the observable and also is positive. Okay. Um, what we want to do next is try to take a non-trivial step, okay? So now, next, we want to consider um, 
writing down something like a joint probability distribution that's associated with this observable taking value x1 at t1 and taking value x2 at time t2. So the logical conjunction of those events. And what we observe is that um, it's actually not possible to write down a joint probability distribution corresponding to this um, conjunction of events, basically because um, you know the projection operators corresponding to the events do not commute. Okay, so we cannot write down a joint probability distribution as such. And the proposal is that instead, um, we'll try to um, write down a quantum extension, a natural quantum extension of the expectation value we had for the single event probability. So this is going to be trace of rho times projection at time t1 times projection at time t2. Right, so uh, that is part of standard quantum mechanics, I think. That's just the probability to, because the measurements don't commute. To, you can't say the joint probabilities unless you specify which is being measured first. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether what you're doing here is equivalent to saying which one's being measured first. Ah, uh, there's no measurement here, so I want. There's a projection oh. operator. Yeah, but uh, making a measurement corresponds to inserting would correspond to inserting projection operators on both sides of the density yes, that's, matrix. That's true. But actually, that means that you're, the answer you've written, the formula you've written isn't manifestly real, I don't think. Yeah, it's not. That's exactly the point. Yeah, it's it's actually generically complex. OK, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's an important point. There is no measurement being made on the state. We are maintaining the coherence of the quantum state. We just want to um, identify these distributions, um, which we can associate with the logical conjunction. So because these projection operators do not commute, they're actually associated with the ordered conjunction, which was not the case in the classical case. Um, but they're you know, associated with ordered conjunction, and they also sum to one over possible values. So in this sense, um, you know, it's justified to call them distributions. It's just that they are no longer positive, like joint probability distributions. In fact, they're generically complex. Okay, so these are generically complex. And what we propose to do is actually identify these as joint quantum distributions which are quantum analogs of joint probability distributions, um, but not quite, not quite joint probability distributions. And one thing, one property I want to note about this um, formula is that it, it has this um, non-trivial time loop. So evolve okay, backward. We have these insertions of projections um, along the time loop, so we can't um, contracted. And so um, this will become somewhat, you know, important. The fact that it's not just forward evolution in time, we have a forward and backward evolution in time. Okay. Um, okay. Let's um, transition. What's the point of, you know, so what's the point of defining these joint quantum distributions? in relation to our goal of making the connection from quantum theory to gravity. And I think here it may be helpful to make the analogy to OTOCs and chaos. So let me draw a table making that analogy. <laughs> So classical dynamical phenomenon. On 
correlators. And uh, gravitational limit now. So recall that chaos um, is an intrinsically classical phenomenon because it refers to the exponential divergence of trajectories in continuum phase space. Um, and in, in, of course, in the quantum case, we, we don't have a continuum phase space. We have a discrete phase space. So, um, but what we can do uh, is um, study a judiciously chosen choice of dynamical correlators, i.e. OTOCs. And what we can do is make contact with chaos um, by studying the, the behavior in time of those dynamical correlators, right? <clears throat> so similarly, we can consider the dynamical phenomenon that is stochastic process. So what is a stochastic process? It, it just refers to um, the totality of the, of the behavior of a random variable in time in target space. So mathematically, it just um, is specified by an infinite sequence of joint probability distributions. So this is a, we saw that the joint probability distributions were only defined in the classical case. So just like chaos, this is a intrinsically classical phenomenon. But uh, what we can do, what I'm proposing is that we can study um, the, so did I mention that I want to call these expectation values that I identified as joint quantum distribution EVPPs, um, standing for expectation value of products of projectors. So EVPPs or joint quantum distribution, joint quantum distributions. My proposal is to study these quantum correlators with the goal of making contact with this um, dynamical phenomenon of, of stochastic process, i.e. make contact with positive joint probability distributions. And uh, so of course this, this, is, this contact with the classical phenomenon is possible in case of there being a large number of degrees of freedom. Um, and a semi-classical limit. Okay. So in the case that the quantum system has these properties, um, you know, we can um, uh, look at the behavior, the leading behavior of these OTFCs, identify a Lipinov exponent, and therefore make, make the contact with chaos. And my claim is that um, under the same conditions, we can um, start with joint quantum distributions, which are complex, but naturally make contact with some joint probability distributions, which are positive. And just like, um, well, similarly to the case of chaos, um, this will, we could leverage, we'll, we'll see that we can leverage this connection to a classical dynamical phenomenon to make um, ultimately um, ulti connect to gravity. Okay, I'm not sure it's coming. And I just want to mention that um, similarly to the fact that in the case of chaos, we had this extremal condition of maximal chaos, uh, which um, is a dynamical condition that says that the quantum theory exhibits gravitational behavior. Um, the conjecture we have is that Markovianity is an extremal condition for stochastic processes to satisfy such that uh, that um, it gives the stochastic process gives rise to gravity. So this is a nice table. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe um, I'll try to explain first the first order question um, of how we can make contact with uh, 
joint probability distribution starting from joint quantum distributions. Okay. Okay, so suppose we had a sequence of um, joint quantum distributions. <clears throat> which we compute, you know, from, for example, from a quantum system as expectation values of products of projectors, like I wrote down previously. So suppose we have, have a sequence of these Qs. <clears throat> the question is, in which cases and how could we make contact with classical joint probability distributions, which are positive? Okay, so because these are all complex. And so, the first condition is that there should be a large number of degrees of freedom so that it's possible to consider continuum joint quantum distributions, which are now um, invariant under, um, oh, sorry, which are invariant over infinitesimal volume elements in, in target space. So if, if the possible values of the observable are dense enough, this should be possible. Okay. I should also <clears throat> make clear that these quantum distributions are um, describing an observable. X. Okay, so the first condition prerequisite is that there should be a large number of degrees of freedom, or, you know, in, in the in the language of quantum systems, the Hilbert space is large, so that the operator corresponding to X has um, a high density of, of eigenvalues. Um, and what we can do, um, uh, sorry. But in addition to this that... condition, okay, we want a second um, additional requirement, which is that these uh, uh, continuum quantum distributions have a semi-classical limit. So why do we require this? Well, if, if these Qs have a semi-classical limit, we can consider integrating them. So right, we can consider the total integral over um, Target space of, of one, say, joint quantum distribution. And by construction, this is just one, but we can evaluate the integral uh, in the leading saddle point approximation. Leading saddle point approximation, in which the integral is evaluated along a path of constant. Um, constant phase, right? So um, we can identify an effective positive integrand. Does that make sense? Because um, the integral evaluates to a positive number and we evaluate it along paths of constant phase and in the variables, we can always identify a positive, effective positive integrand. And the proposal is to um, identify this effective integrand with um, with an effective uh, joint probability distribution arising in the classical limit. Okay, so effective joint probability distributions uh, arising in the classical limit. Okay, so far, this describes the contact one can make with a classical stochastic process, you know, given we satisfy these two conditions. Um, but what I just mentioned before is that if in addition to these conditions, we have the um, additional property that the quantum dynamics represented by these Qs 
um, the, the P's that they gave rise to have the Markov property, okay? So let's, let's say that again. So if the quantum dynamics represented by these Q's have the property that the P's that they produce in this way have the Markov property, then the claim is that um, these Q's give rise to space, time, and gravity in the semi-classical limit. So to motivate this statement, um, uh, let me segue to um, describing how in a classical Markov process, um, we can write down a generator equation that characterizes the process, um, which describes the instantaneous evolution of, of probability measures according to conditional probability distributions. Question. Yeah. So why, why is it exactly that the probability distributions rho are complex? Because I would assume that they're related to the wave functions in general through ah. shy, shy star shy. Uh, so you're asking in, in why these real. Q's are complex? Not Q's, the rows, the in, in the quantum theory. Ah, uh, the P's. Yeah, yeah, the P's. So these P's I mean, I'm saying are positive. No, initially you said they were complex and you said that you want them to be, you want to make them positive by summing over the phases or something. Isn't that correct? Yeah, so these Qs are complex. Okay. And what I'm doing is evaluating a total integral of this Q over the um, target values x, x, n, dot, 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 x, one. And I'm saying in the, if, if there is a semi-classical limit involving a saddle point approximation, we can always identify an effective integrand, which is positive. And I'm going to identify that effective integrand as a joint probability distribution that arises from this um, quantum Q in the semi uh, in the in, sorry in the in, in the strict classical limit. So this is in the in the strict saddle point approximation, strict strictly leading saddle point approximation. Yeah, my question is to start with why is Q complex? Ah, why is Q complex? So yeah. let's just. Um, I'll write down the two event quantum distribution again. So let's let's see. Just um, doing away with the D's here for to explain this feature. So this was trace of row times yeah. vector at time t two. Yeah. Times projector at time t at, yeah t two. And the point is that that the projection uh, that the product of projections is not a projector. The product of projections is only a projection if they commute. So in generically, the product of these projections is not a projection. And so the trace of row times the product is not positive. Yeah. But in, in, you the... can see that, sorry. How, how is P and rho defined P? I mean, this, this P of X2 and P of X1, how are they defined in terms of the wave functions of the system? Ah, they're not in, defined in terms of the wave function. They're defined in terms of the operator corresponding to the observable. So these are projection operators onto eigenspaces of the Hilbert space with eigenvalues corresponding, uh, you know, with um, eigenvalues corresponding to the, you know, eigenvalues of this operator. So, is that clear? So they have nothing to do with the state of the system. They only have to do with the observable that we're considering. Okay. Was that clear? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay, so I was saying that if in addition to these two conditions, um, the P's that are produced by this um, procedure <laughs> exhibit the Markov property, then the claim is that um, this quantum process consisting of these distributions give rise to gravity. So that's the claim I made in the table with um, 
right, with uh, maximal chaos corresponding to gravity in, in the in this in the case of chaos and in the case of um, stochastic processes, I was claiming that the um, that Markovianity is the characterization corresponding to gravity. Sorry, because uh, what I'm saying is just getting repeated back to me and I'm not being very coherent. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so to motivate, to motivate that statement, let me segue to discuss in, um, an entirely classical process. So entirely classical results um, having to do with classical Markov processes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, what happens if we have a classical Markov process? Um, okay, so, well, first of all, how do we define a Markov process? Well, if we have a series of um, probability distributions, right? So I'm going to talk. Um, um, this sequence of joint probability distributions represents a Markov process if it is entirely characterized by this conditional probability, uh, this conditional probability distribution of the two event distribution divided by, oh, sorry, I have to, um, divided by the one event probability and um, is this clear? So in particular, any um, N event joint probability can be obtained by acting on an initial probability distribution with a chain of conditional probabilities, right? Dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this is the chain of conditional probabilities. And um, this means that the entire process is characterized by this kernel, right? Um, and uh, what we can do is consider the action of this kernel on some probability measure, right? It essentially gives the evolution of some probability measure according to, if forward, so the evolution forward in time according to this um, conditional quantum distribution over time, okay? So this, if you integrate it over X1, this is, um, we can write it as the action of the Markov operator of the process. So this is just um, okay. So this is just a definition of what the Markov operation is on a probability measure, and it's just um, evolution forward in time according to conditional um, probability distributions. And because these um, kernels have the mathematical property of um, uh, What's it called? So um, it's the semi-group property, right? Meaning that, for example, if you um, multiply or sorry, if you integrate, So this property is just that you can multiply together two kernels, meaning that you 
integrate. Um, then you get back the original kernel. Okay. So this is the semi-group property. And because of this property, essentially we can define a generator, which is the time derivative, which involves the time derivative of this kernel. And you can exponentiate that time derivative, obtain, um, I guess, this uh, kernel at, at all finite times. So this, um, time derivative is, is an instantaneous time derivative. So let me write down the definition of, of the generator of this process, which characterizes the entire process. Because um, the only thing, you know, this process is characterized entirely by the conditional probability kernel and the probability kernel can be obtained as the exponential of this instantaneous time derivative, which is called the generator. And essentially the action of this generator characterizes the entire process is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so, so we had um, we had an action of the Markov operator on, <clears throat> on a probability measure, right? Which is given by this conditional kernel integrated against the probability measure. Uh, and so the generator, the definition is that we take the instantaneous time derivative um, of this action of the conditional kernel um, on a probability measure. This is essentially the definition of the generator. And what happens in cases where we actually have um, kernels, concrete kernels, concrete, um, concrete probability kernels, for example, if we have um, Brownian motion in one dimension where this is like a Gaussian or something like, um, <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, so in Brownian motion, if we have this, <clears throat> local kernel, um, we can write down what this generator is using the explicit form. And what we are able to do is relate the time derivative, which is the generator to spatial derivatives in target space. So let's try to write down what this is. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so now I'm, I factored out of these Ds like a, a static flat measure, and I'm just I'm going to write in terms of the position. X2 is Right, and, and if we um, plug this in here and think of expanding this probability measure in X2 minus X1, the point is that higher order terms in the expansion in X2 minus X1 get suppressed in T2 minus T1 as well um, because, of, because of the concentration or locality of this kernel at small times. And as a result, we have the expansion um, plus high order terms in the time difference. Um, let's see, is it? And we are left um, after we take T2 to T1 with um, one half second derivative of X2. So this is an example of, of how the time evolution of some probability measure is related to the spatial distribution of the, of, of the measure. Um, yeah. Question. Yeah. So here you're saying that you're considering Brownian motion to take care of the 
joint probability distribution for going from x2 to x1, x1 to x2, right? In time t1 to t2, that's right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. But shouldn't, shouldn't you, instead of Brownian motion, which, uh, I mean, shouldn't you consider <clears throat> the motion of a quantum particle where uh, instead of the Brownian kernel, you have the Feynman kernel mm -hmm. for the, for the, for the, for the, yeah. Probability. Yeah, so if you, amplitude. I mean, if you think of trying to formulate an analogous quantum problem, obviously, like you could come up with many ideas. Um, but the point is that we want to working with the exact um, EBPP that I wrote down. Those are the right. Those will be the right things to use that um, give rise to gravity. So, so just like. Maybe if I yeah, refer to the case of chaos again, like, you know, many people try to find ways or came up with, you know, many potential ways that you could um, connect to chaos from quantum systems. But ultimately, there was, you know, it was important to identify the exact right type of dynamical correlators, and that was the fruitful way to proceed in relation to making connections to gravity. Okay. So yeah, potentially you could make different kinds of analogies, but maybe maybe there is like a, an ideal way to generalize this. And I'm claiming that that path is through um, the dynamical correlators, which I called EBPPs. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so that was an, an, um, an analysis of an entirely classical situation. So now we want to go back to the quantum case. We want to, we were considering um, a series of cues, right, which were computed using the, the EBPP pres uh, prescriptions. Um, um, And um, so the final claim is that if uh, there's a large number of degrees of freedom involved and these cues have a semi-classical limit, so we could make the contact to positive P's like I uh, wrote before. And if those P's have the Markov property, then we can characterize this quantum sequence by a generator equation, just like we could for P's that possess the Markov property, where um, instead of the joint probability kernel, uh, the conditional probability kernel, sorry, that characterized the classical Markov process, we're gonna use a conditional quantum kernel involving uh, these Qs. So what, so remember we had a, Classical. In the classical case, we had a conditional probability kernel um, that looked like this. Two, one. Um, but in the quantum case, we're going to consider the quantum kernel corresponding to you know the two event quantum distribution divided by the one event quantum distribution and we're going to write down a generated equation like we did for the classical case with one important distinction so in the classical case, remember we had this equation. So we had <clears throat> this time derivative on the left-hand side, um, which was essentially, um, well, it, it worked 
Well, the equation worked like a definitional equation, right? So remember, we had something like one in the in the case of um, in the case of the Brownian motion in one dimension. We had an equation like this, which is essentially a definitional equation because it says that the time evolution of that distribution is given by its spatial derivative, its spatial distribution. In the quantum case, what we're going to do is similarly as to the classical case, we're going to write, um, we're going to use use the specific form of, of the quantum kernel on the right hand side. Um, so let me, okay. And um, um, so remember what we did in the classical case is we took the time derivative after integrating. But on the left hand side, instead of this um, sort of definitional expression, we're going to put in an expression involving resulting from quantum evolution directly applied to this kernel. So, so I'm going to directly take the time derivative of this kernel. Where, importantly, remember, I emphasize that this kernel contains a non trivial time loop. So acting with this time derivative, uh, we'll get two pieces, one from forward evolution in time and one from backward evolution in time. So let me write down that explicitly. Okay. So, So essentially, because this Q um, involves going back and forth in time, the time derivative acts on two places and gives two terms that together form a commutator. And so um, in the quantum case, I put this, you know, this expression which encapsulates or which results from the quantum evolution, um, time evolution in the quantum theory on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I, I sort of do something which is similar to the classical case, which is just take the time derivative after integrating with a kernel. And, you know, I, I guess, uh, well, what's technically important here is that integration and differentiation do not commute. So this is not a trivial equation. Um, and actually, this gives a constraint on, on the probability measure itself. So physically, I think we can understand this as saying that the quantum evolution is constraining probability measures which evolve under according to conditional quantum distributions. Um, so is your system relativistic or non-relativistic? So my system is relativistic. I'm assuming it's relativistic. So let me make, perhaps make this more concrete by um, going to JT gravity, right? So if we go to JT gravity, the target space is um, essentially anti disorder space. So it's, it's a relativistic space. Um, so in, in the case of JT gravity, this probability measure that we're considering and in a sort of a static invariant measure factors out of it. So this is the, um, 
volume measure of two-dimensional ADS. And the remaining factor is, you know, is a probability density, but it turns out that if we write this um, constraint equation for this probability measure, we actually can show that in the semi-classical limit, we get the Einstein's equations for the dilaton, where the dilaton is exactly identified with this probability density. So maybe I can write that more explicitly. It might help. Yeah. So, Jeff, sorry? Any questions? Yeah, so generally, you know, the final proposal, so, so, so going back to this um, quantum generator equation I wrote down, the final conjecture is that um, um, after identifying this probability measure that is constrained with, with the volume measure of space-time, this constraint equation gives rise to um, Einstein's equations involving the metric of that space-time in the semi-classical limit. So that's the general conjecture. And what we can explicitly verify in the case of JT gravity, where the problem is linear, is that this conjecture works. Okay. So in JT gravity, you know, this invariant submeasure, this invariant two-dimensional measure factors out of both the probability measure we are solving for and from these um, quantum distributions. They, they factor out, right? So these Qs are computed entirely in the theory of, in the quantum theory of the boundary. And so if we write down a generator equation involving these Qs, um, let me, for technical reasons, the equation involves three event quantum distributions, not just the two event quantum distributions. Um, let me just write down the full equation. Okay, so. So with this um, decomposition of the probability measure we're solving for, um, this is the equation that we have. So limit T2 goes to Q1 equals, uh, yeah. For technical reasons, we have to um, insert an intermediate point and the right-hand side also involves three event Qs. So let's Yeah, so the the generator equation in JT gravity looks like this, and very um, somewhat magically, if we take the semi-classical limit of that equation, <clears throat> what we get is this equation. Okay. So here, um, because we're working in the semi-classical limit, essentially these integrals are concentrated along classical trajectories. So we fix the point x3 and another point x1 is approaching x3. And there are two coordinates, this directional coordinate t and a, and a coordinate corresponding to the geodesic distance. So this so L and T are two relative coordinates. And so if you look at what this integral equation has turned into, 
it's become this equation where this prefactor, dx over PL, these um, depend on L. So the different components of the, um, the distinct components of this tensor depend on L in different ways. So for this equation to hold, regardless of the direction, the point x1 is approaching x3, um, this prefactor equation has to hold, but these are nothing but Einstein's equations involving the dilaton, which motivates us to make the identification that the dilaton in the gravity theory is in fact the probability density constrained by the quantum dynamics of, of the boundary. Yeah, so um, yeah, some concluding thoughts. Sorry, this was suboptimal because yeah, of, um, uh, because of being remote. But some concluding thoughts are um, that this quantum stochastic process involving these you know, definition of dynamical correlators seem to be the mechanism by which gravity arises from quantum. And, um, you know, it's exciting because suppose if we, for example, if we had some, you know, condensed matter realization of say like a holographic quantum system, then we know exactly what kind of correlators we want to study in that system. Perhaps we can measure these joint quantum distributions, just like people are coming up with ways to measure OTOCs and such. And then we have a direct understanding of space-time itself as being um, a probability uh, distribution. Okay, so we have an, an understanding of the volume measure of space-time as a probability measure that evolves according to those distributions. So I think that's um, potentially exciting that the connection to experiment has become much more concrete. And thirdly, theory-wise, I think um, there's much more to explore. I mean, one thing I'm thinking of is um, how do we derive the gravitational action starting from the quantum theory? Because usually in deriving Einstein's equations, we vary the action, but here I've sort of started directly from a quantum problem and then found an exact quantum generator equation which reduces Einstein's equations. So um, I think sort of understanding the relationship between action and, um, and the quantum theory is an interesting direction. And I think there are also um, potentially connections to um, the work that people have been doing in the bootstrap community. Because if you think about the problem of how do we um, write down these um, EVPPs, the expectation value of products of projectors in higher dimensional CFTs, for example, that are holographic, right? Um, you might wonder, is it even possible to have like a, a tangible expression for these projection operators onto uh, bulk points of space time? And I think there's actually reason to be optimistic about that, for example, I become aware of, well, I mean, I mean, already I think people have found ways to identify um, bulk points using boundary data in the CFT. And also I'm aware of, I think um, I've been made aware of some upcoming work where, you know, people actually find that, um, for example, Einstein's equations in the bulk are local in terms of the CFT data. So that actually makes me very optimistic that I can calculate these EVPPs. So here I, I used sort of the low energy Hilbert space in JT gravity, but I'm optimistic that I can try to, that we can try to calculate um, these EVPPs directly, um, maybe in terms of microscopic correlators and high dimensional CFTs. So I think that's also an interest, interesting direction to think about. And ultimately, you know, we want to, um, uh, build a general theory of quantum gravity that goes beyond ADS CFT. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for, for listening. I think I've, um, my time is, is done. So,
All right, fantastic. Let's thank it. And do we have any final uh, comments and questions for the audience? So, what is the formula distribution corresponding to cosmological constant and Einstein field equation? What is the term? Yes. Ah, okay. So, here, this is a term involving the three event quantum distribution. And actually, all non trivial terms in the Einstein's equations come from this. Like other terms, just cancel cancel some auxiliary terms here. But all the terms remaining originate from this three event distribution term. Is it invariant under, uh, under transformation or it is varying with space and time? Well, I mean, this integral is certainly invariant. <laughs> so whatever comes out of it is invariant. This, inver this integral is coordinate invariant, yeah. Um, all right, are there any other comments or questions, perhaps on Zoom? Uh, well, if not, then let's thank Josephine once again.